The beauty of Australia's open plains and big skies comes with a starkness that underpins the isolation of being miles from anywhere and anyone. The vastness of this great country means there are thousands of Australians who not only live out of reach of mental health care experts, but also sometimes just a friendly ear. There's so few of us out here, but we've all got some problem and issue. We don't see too many people. Um, and then everyone that I knew that had any issues wouldn't talk about it. They wouldn't open up. This can be a lonely life. And research suggests that loneliness is associated with an increased risk of certain mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, and sleep problems. Throw into the mix the effects of drought and financial hardship, and all of a sudden, the mental health statistics in the bush become alarming. Personally, no. 21, I think. Uh, men and uh, one girl, I think, that, uh, or boys and men that committed suicide in our local area. And you know, that's, that's just, uh, that's a lot of death. lived here on this property all my life, uh, 61, just gone, and uh, father came here in 1946 with mum, a couple of young kids. Eventually I took over the farm after dad died. First noticed there was something different about me, in my early 40s, uh, and I wasn't coping, coping as well as I could have. There was a bit of pressure on me because at the age of 39 I crushed my hand in a, in a log splitter which forced me basically to give up shearing which is a major income. The year previous to that my mother died as well and she was probably my major confidant other than my wife um, and gradually I just got worse and worse. At one stage here I was, uh, my wife didn't know at the time but she'd go off to work. I'd get up out of bed but I didn't, I'd just go in the lounge room and lie on the floor and fetal position for till 11, 12 o'clock or whatever. Feed the sheep for a couple of hours, and then come back and lie on the land for the floor again. It wasn't right, I was uh, thinking about suicide. It just popped in my head every now and then, and it's a queer thing. It, even when I was suicidal, I didn't want to die, but I wanted to kill myself, but I didn't want to die. So I knew I had to do something. I went to the local GP and I oh, know you'll be right, you're you're all right. Taught me three GPs um, and a couple of other visits to counsellors to actually get diagnosed. Finally get some recommendations to get to a, some counsellors and then eventually to a psychiatrist in Horsham. But in the meantime, I was so tired that to go to Horsham or Hamilton to the doctors or the, to a counsellor or to a psychiatrist, I would have to stop twice in an hour and have two sleeps. I could go 20 minutes and then I'd have to stop and I'd go another 20 minutes and I'd have to stop again and have a sleep in the car but so I could get to these things. I was just that run down. It, it, it was really getting to taxi because they'd make the appointments or I'd make the appointments and it turns out on that particular day, you might fly on a flybone sheep or something. So you'd have to either leave that sheep or there's something to do, and you just have to try and put that in the back of your mind for your own health and go and do this this whole uh, trip to Horsham and uh, then perhaps not even feel better of it when you got home. The Royal Flying Doctor Service recognised this problem and in 2017 instituted their wellbeing service bringing mental health support to Victorians who are ordinarily out of reach. This combination of travelling clinicians and telehealth services has already helped thousands find a way out of the wilderness of mental illness. The local Harrow Bush Nursing Centre eventually put me onto the Royal Flying Doctors. We started doing phone um, consultations. We were pretty flat out at the time, so I did the phone counselling through Bluetooth on the tractor whilst driving around the paddocks. And she actually asked, she said, what are you actually doing? I said, I'm driving a tractor. She said, what, the whole time we've been talking? I said, yeah, the whole time we've been talking. I said, I've done, a, I don't know, so many acres at the time. And she just laughed and 
I said, oh, I said, are you comfortable with that? She said, yeah, as long as you can focus. More comfortable, more relaxed for me. And, you know, and always there's, there's tears come along. You walk out of your room and you've got tears in your eyes. You're just leaving, leaving the premises. It's, uh, oh, well, I'm not too bad with it now, but it was a bit embarrassing first up. Uh, not that anyone would notice anyway, I don't think, but I did. People are starting to listen and say, and take notice that, well, he's not right. And, and I, I frequent the pub a couple of times a week and um, I catch up with a heap of farmers there and you could see the cracks developing some of them, uh, if, whether it be a, a son that they've had an argument with their son or, or things haven't gone right in the farm or whatever. They, you see them sometimes, they're just about ready to crack, but they go, oh no, it'll be right, we'll tough it out. And they really need a mate to go there and, and uh, you know, just be there with them for a few hours, I think. When I was growing up, of course, we were always kids that you're supposed to be seen and not heard. And I thought, oh, I can't, you know, I'll get my turn when I get old, I'll be able to talk and, uh, and the kids can listen. Well, it's done a full reverse now, hasn't it? The kids now, they're the ones we're looking at with the grandkids and that. We want to hear them and see them and listen to what they got to say. And yeah, it's, it's, and it's great. It, it, we were so restricted when we were kids just because the parents, not so much the parents and grandparents, yeah, they, we just, oh, get out, go outside and play, go outside and play, go, you know, we want to talk. Whereas now it's more of a group involvement, which is much better. And, uh, well, our family, in our family anyway. The, uh, the grannies are just, just uh, wonderful. <laughs> the wellbeing program has grown massively since it started. And while it's clearly focused on helping people like Stephen, it helps rural Victoria as a whole. If the people who live here can't get the help they need, they'll simply leave, or worse. And these small communities will slowly evaporate as they become less and less sustainable, exacerbating the very problems that the Royal Flying Doctor Service is here to help with. It's vital and inspiring work.